since time immemorial from the starlit skies pondered by Greek sages to the mind-bending revelations of modern physics, humanity has embarked on a magnificent odyssey to unravel the very fabric of the cosmos. Today we embark on a similar journey following the footsteps of intrepid visionaries who dared to question the very essence of space and time. Through the prism of relativity's paradigm-shifting insights, we shall navigate the celestial firmament, uncover the profound mathematical concepts and visionary ideas that have reshaped our understanding of the universe. Along the way, we shall delve into the intricacies of mathematical concepts, encounter visionary ideas that dance at the edge of perception, and unearth surprising truths hidden within the annals of time. As we journey forth, let curiosity guide us, wonder propel us, and the universe beckon us our ultimate quest. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel, Physics for Students. Welcome to this fresh video on time and space where we start unfolding the untold story and there are a lot of new things which we are going to learn. We first need to understand that when we are talking about the story and the mysteries and physics of time and space, why do we need to define space in physics? What would happen if we do not define space in physics? Well, regarding this, when we delve into this, first what we find is a philosophical conundrum defining the undefinable. Now, human mind naturally seeks categorization and definition. We yearn to understand the world around us and language helps us to achieve this. Yet, space presents a unique challenge. Now, if I de define some kind of an area like this and we call this as a space. Now, the, here is a table and a tree. And we cannot tell that, okay, so here it is. We cannot say that here is a table and there is a tree. Because space is not a distinctive object we can point and say. And it is an inseparable backdrop to everything else. Now the ancient Greeks, they saw space as an empty container, a passive stage for object to exist in. Now if you talk of Plato, he introduced the concept of receptacle or kora, an infinite formless void that passively receives forms and allows object to exist. Aristotle, however, defined the space and called it as topos, meaning a place. He saw it as an extension or, di or dimension associated with an individual object, not an independent entity. Euclid, his geometry, formalized this conceptualization, treating space as absolute and unchanging. He viewed it as a three-dimensional grid with fixed distances and relationships independent of any objects within it. From the Greeks to Aristotle, then to Euclid, we then find that the three important concepts which emerges out of this. The first one is called passivity. Space was not seen as having an active properties or dynamics. It was simply a neutral backdrop for objects to move and interact. Invisibility. It was beyond sensory perception. Unlike objects with qualities like color or texture, space itself did not possess any inherent characteristics. Infinity. The Greeks generally conceived of space as unbounded and infinitely extending in all directions. From here we go to the next part of our video where we try to understand what is called the evolution of the concept of space, how the concept of space evolved coming up in the next part of our video. Now, Thales and Milesians, the early Greek philosophers such as Thales speculated about the fundamental substances of the universe but did not explicitly delve into the nature of space. The Milesian school including Anaximander and Anaximenes focused on cosmological principles but did not provide any detailed concept of space. Well, the Plato's dialogue, the famous Timaeus, discusses the creation of the cosmos introducing the concept of receptacle, receptacle as a medium for the formation of physical ent entities. However, Plato did not develop a detailed theory of space. A Euclidean geometry, Euclid in his works Elements, uh, developed the foundation of classical geometry which became the standard 
for understanding spaces for centuries. Euclidean geometry assumes a flat three-dimensional space. Now, from here, what we find is uh, the evolution of the concept of space with a rapid development, first with Copernicus. Uh, he challenged the geocentric model, placing the sun at the center of the solar system. This shift in cosmology had implications for the understanding of space and the arrangement of celestial bodies. Kepler's law of planetary motion near in the early 17th century provided empirical rules governing the motion of planets in space, contributing to a more precise understanding of celestial dynamics. Newton's absolute space introduced the concept of absolute space which exists independently of the objects within it. Newtonian physics based on classical mechanics treated space as a fixed and unchanging entity. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz challenged Newton's uh, uh, concept of absolute space, proposing a relational view where space is defined of the relationships between objects. And Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity revolutionized our understanding of space and time, and it introduced the concept of space-time where space and time are interwoven and the speed of light is constant for all observers. From here, what we get is the famous Einstein's general theory of relativity around 1915, which described gravity as the curvature of space-time caused by mass and energy. This introduced the idea that space itself is dynamic and can be curved by the presence of matter. Now, in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, the nature of space becomes subject to uncertainty principles and quantum fluctuations. The concept of space-time form, a dynamic and fluctuating structure at small scale emerges. And finally, we come to what we call string theory, uh, proposes the existence of additional spatial dimensions beyond the family of three. The nature of space in string theory is intricate and involves the interplay of various dimensions and vibrational modes. Now, out of that, what comes in our mind is that, uh, first question is that, what is the fundamental space of geometry that represents physical space? So out of all those, starting from the Greeks to the Timaeus, uh, Plato's uh, famous Timaeus and uh, Copernican revolution, the question that comes is that, do we have a space in geometry that represents the physical space? And to the answer to that is Euclidean space. I will just show what I actually showed you in Euclidean space in the earlier video coming up into the next part. So in the earlier video, if you look into it, I have explained the concepts of general relativity starting with Euclidean space, where I have defined what is a Euclidean space and the metric of Euclidean space. I have also defined Euclidean space in terms of Cartesian coordinates and why it is called that it is called a positive definite because each time you square it, you get a positive and a real number. You can go to back to my earlier video, which is in my playlist of general theory of relativity, where these concepts are dealt much more in details. Now, from Euclidean space, the next question that comes to our mind is that what do we get a space when we move into a non-Euclidean space? And that is the central part of our discussion and many things more, which is called a Minkowski space. This also I have shown in my earlier video, which starts with what is called CT. That is, we have a, a typical... I would say independent coordinate for the time variable and what is called time-like, light-like and space-like geodesics. I have also explained in details the Euclidean space vis-a-vis -vis the four-dimensional, I would say Minkowski space and how the concepts of light cone emerges, I would say, and how do we get a hyperboloid model instead of a flat Euclidean space. These are already discussed in my earlier videos. The description is already there in the playlist. You can go ahead and check. What is important from here is that we come to a research paper. The research paper is the, by this famous uh, French physicist whose name is Philbert Damour. I don't know whether I'm making the French pronunciation correctly. And he was a permanent professor in theoretical physics. And he wrote a paper which shows that what is missing from Minkowski's Raum und Zeit. This is the lecture which I'm going to explain. And I'm going to explore from the next part of the video many, uh, I would say, uh, undiscovered, uh, you know, uh, phenomena, undiscovered facts and uh, um, wonderful ideas which is reflected in his paper and the entire description 
uh, I would say the link for this entire research paper is given in the description box. If you want, please go ahead and you can uh, find it. So this paper is something very astounding, carries a lot of important facts and along with that I have done my own research. So I would be speaking on some hidden facts on the evolution of the concept of space and time. But before that, I need to go back to a very important timeline. Now, what do I mean by timeline? I will just explain in the next part of the video. This timeline will help us, it will be a guide to explore the concepts of space and time. The first date is 1907, 5th of November. Now, Minkowski's initial endeavor in 1907 to formulate velocity for vectors was flawed due to a misunderstanding of proper time, which is akin to early struggles of mechanics students. However, his outline research program laid the foundation for subsequent significant advancement. The next comes on 1908, 21st of February, just after three months after his initial efforts, Minkowski submitted a substantial manuscript to the printers for publication in Göttingen Nachrichten. I will come to that, what do I mean? And finally, on 1908, 21st of September, the famous Raum und Zeit, which is, means space and time, got published. Now, with this, I would like to uh, tell that these are the three important papers which uh, I would say planted the seed of the foundation of the concept of space and time. First, we are going to start with the second paper that is 21st of February 1908. What actually this paper means and why it is important coming up into the next part of our video. Now you see this is actually the German title of this video. I will show you everything where you can find this original paper. But actually more or less roughly if you translate it in English, it shows the basic equations for the electromagnetic processes in moving bodies. Now the German uh, journal I would say which first published the paper is this one. Nachrichten which means news. Von de which means of the Kongilischen Gesellschaft der Wissenschaften zu Göttingen. It more or less with my very poor German, if I translate it, it shows news of the Royal Society of Sciences in Göttingen. And as you can see, the year, Jare, it actually in 1908, that means the year was basically 1908, and Mathematisch Physikalisch class means mathematical physics class. And the paper originally is this one, which I just showed you the basic equations for the electromagnetic processes in moving bodies. And you can see here, actually the paper was uh, submitted to be presented at the meeting on 21st December 1907, but somehow got published in 1908. And that is quite okay. It would get for, for peer review, etc. So December 1907, this is the original paper which is published, which was presented to Nachrichten von der Kongilischen Gesellschaft der Wissenschaften. That is the news of the Royal Society of Sciences Göttingen. And it was finally published in 1908. Now, this paper is very important. This paper is one of the most important papers in the history of physics and mathematics. I would say overall science because this paper contained something very important which we need to discuss. But before that, let me show you this original paper where from I have collected. So here is the original German website, Göttingen Digitization Center, a service of the SUB Göttingen. This is the website and if you really know German, you can go ahead and read this paper. It is called link of the original paper is given actually in the description box and here is the original German manuscript on the left hand side which you can see. Now the most important part is that Minkowski was the first to realize that the relativity principle as formulated by Lorentz and Einstein led to the abandonment of the concept of space and time as separate entities. This is actually most, uh, mostly uh, explained in this paper and to their replacement by a four-dimensional what we call space-time continuum. He introduced the concept of time as a fourth variable in this paper delivered in 1907, yet the reaction for this monumental achievement was something different. What was the reaction to the scientific community? Did people like Einstein, Hilbert and Felix Klein 
took it in a very positive way or there were problems? Let us find it out in the next part of the video. What was the reaction of Minkowski's first paper which laid the foundation of space-time? Now, some physicists and most notably, this is the original paper. As you can see, Raum actually means space, Und means and and uh, sight means time. I'm very sorry for my incorrect German pronunciation. I'm trying to make it as perfect as possible. Now, some physicists and most notably Einstein himself reacted somewhat negatively to Minkowski's four-dimensional formulation. I mean to say of special relativity. Now, Albert Einstein and Jacob Laub, he, this Jacob Laub is a physicist from Austria-Hungary who is best known for his work with Albert Einstein in the early period of special relativity. Both Einstein and Jacob Laub were among the first to react in this print. They then proceeded to retranslate Minkowski's elegant four-vector derivations back into vector analysis, which becomes relatively easier to understand, and published in Annalen der Physik in the summer of 1908. Now, here is the actually this paper, the name I have given so that you can remember. Now, there are other physicists, for example, Planck, Max Planck, who had been the first leading physicist to understand the conceptual novelty of Einstein's 1905 special relativity paper and appreciated the elegance of Minkowski's reformulation of special relativity. Along with that was Arnold Sommerfeld, who came to comprehend special relativity in great part thanks to the four-dimensional formalism of Minkowski. Actually, Minkowski's first technical paper, which I just showed you, used an abstract mathematical notation, which was not much of help for the physicist. That is why you can see that uh, Jacob Laub and Einstein did not respond on a very positive manner. What was those which I mean by abstract mathematical notations? Let us look on to those abstract mathematical notations so that we can understand that uh, what, what, what was actually the problem. Now, this is actually the English translation of Professor Philbaut's paper. And here I have underlined, as you can see, the lor f equals to a minus s and lor f star equal to zero. Here, actually, lor means a contraction. Okay, with the four-dimensional gradient operator. So, more or less, you can see that Minkowski uses the matrix calculus to express the covariance property. So, this type of notation, etc., I mean, say it is not quite known during that time. So, he writes, as you can see, x equal to ax prime, and f prime is equal to a inverse of a phase. So, using x4 equals to it. So, this is something the notation did not immediately appeal to the physicists. So, obviously, it did not help much physicists and Minkowski's abstract formalism was later translated into calculus by Einstein and others and this actually led to the formulation of tensor calculus. But during that time which I am, we are speaking of, Minkowski actually did not know much about that. Now, through the efforts of several physicists, notably Sommerfeld and Max von Law, Minkowski's abstract formalism was translated into tensor calculus form, which helped physicists to master and use with profit the four-dimensional formalism. And Max Theodor Felix von Law was a German physicist who received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1914 for his discovery of the diffraction of X-rays by crystals. Now, this was basically, uh, you know, planting the seed, but obviously met with a lot of criticism as well as appreciation. And Max von Law, Arnold Sommerfeld, they actually kind of a uh, translated and they actually got the essence of that. So, as you can see, I've written that after comprehensive initial reluctance caused by the unfamiliar notation of Minskowski, slowly his formulation started to attract a lot of attention. Even the mightiest oak tree begins as a fragile sprout pushing even through the earth with an imperfect form yet unwavering spirit. So too scientific and mathematical theories may bear the marks of imperfection, hold within them the spark of groundbreaking concepts. Though initially met with resistance, Minkowski's paper, although flawed, forever altered our perception of reality. Indeed, the terrain of discovery is rarely paved with flawless creations. Mistakes are not missteps, but stepping stones. Each error, a lesson etched in the annals of the progress. 
as I have given a few snapshots from the original German paper and I feel so bad that I don't know German and I would have ripped the original papers it feels so great but those who know German please go ahead and if you can understand please do put up some of the important comment about this paper on the comment box and please do subscribe to my channel physics for students because it is your support which helps me grow now here you can see what happens is that this is around a 60 pages paper but there is not a single diagram which is in this paper so if you're thinking that the space time diagram the light cone emerged out of the first paper absolutely not so there were no uh, you know a kind of a paper and minkowski presented in this paper what is called the correct form of four velocity by taking derivatives so let us look into some of the most important aspects what he presented in this paper first of all minkowski presents the correct form of four velocity by taking derivatives relative to uh, the proper time and he formalizes his four dimensional approach to relativity that becomes standard we know that he introduced the terms like space like vector time like vector and light cone and world line and he also presents the complete four tensor form of the electromagnetic fields now here you can see that this is Raum's sight line which is called basically the space time. Raum means space and sight means uh, time and that is how it happened. Welt actually in Germans what I understood is world. So Welt line would be world line and proper time is Eigen sight. Eigen means proper. So in this way you know the all the terms that we use now in special theory of relativity is actually introduced by Minkowski in his paper. Now, before going to the next part of our video, I just need to uh, introduce a small mathematical concept and that would help you to understand and appreciate what Minkowski did in his next formulation. Now, in mathematics, if we take a kind of a differential forms, it actually, you know, unified, it is a unified approach to define what we call integrants over curved surfaces, etc. So, for example, if we take the expression f, f of x dx, then a, what we call is an example of a first form. It can be, uh, I would say, integrated over an interval a, b, which gives into this, right? And then we can get a kind of a second form, which can be further integrated into this. Now, once you read this, what is called the first form and the second form, which is this one and this one. So, what we get from here is this one. You see... The paper, which is translated by Professor Thilbert, which you can uh, essentially in English, which you can go ahead and read it. So you see what he writes is that he uses the term which is called tractor. Okay, T-R-A-K-T-O-R. -R. And this tractor is basically a six component space time and which we actually now called it as a second form. So the index notation in 1907 lecture actually contains... Uh, one very advanced concept which is using because he was not aware about the first and the second form so he used something called tractor so we now are digging deep into history and we can find these are actually finding out in a nice manner and you you can see uh, at the bottom if you read is invariant under four dimensional rotations that means a kind of a tensor or a tensorial form which is slowly taking place with the unfolding of history and is using something which is called a tractor which is now which is called a two form so Minkowski's four-dimensional, I would say, formalism of relativistic electromagnetism transcended mere mathematical manipulation. And I would say that uh, it revealed a wealth of invariance uh, uh, veiled by the traditional frameworks of Einstein, Lorenz, Poincaré. In Minkowski's paradigm, the contraction of a proper four-vector with itself I mean to say the contraction of the proper four vector itself invariably yields an invariant, a phenomena that arises due to the existence of multiple fundamental four vectors. In the hallowed halls of intellectual endeavor, Hermann Minkowski diligently prepared to unveil his magnum opus, a masterpiece poised to transcend the bounds of scholarly discourse. What was that coming up into the next part of our video? The most famous paper, I would say, which is called Raum und Zeit, which is called Space and Time, first came into being in 1908. So we trace back now to 21st of September 1908, Wilhelmian Germany was near its zenith. The 8th Congress of Naturalists and Physicians is meeting at Cologne. At the speaker's podium was none other than Hermann Minkowski. He was 44 years old. 
are holding a cheered professorship which the University of Gottingen has created expressly for his benefit. And you know this paper which uh, uh, starts with gentlemen. I am to say maybe there were ladies but very few in number. So he writes gentlemen. The conceptions of time and space which I wish to develop here have arisen on the basis of experimental physics. Therein lies their strength, their tendency is radical. From now on, space in itself and time in itself are destined to be reduced to shadows and only a sort of union of the two will retain an independent existence. The opening statement which became a kind of a, kind of a quotation was first told on 21st September 1908, standing on the podium, a young mathematician physicist, 44 years old, Hermann Minkowski, who was not going to leave for long because he died at a very young age of appendicitis, some say out of bursting of gallbladder. Anyway, now, so you can see that now we come to the first description and first pictorial description of the light cone. Now, so to paint a vivid picture, so this one is the first Minkowski space-time diagram. So to paint a vivid picture of his revolutionary ideas, Minkowski gave birth to this one, the iconic symbol of relativity, the space-time diagram. You can imagine a canvas where one spatial dimension stretches across the bottom and time intervened with the speed of light climbs the vertical axis. On the stage, light itself dances along lines tilted at a precise 45 degree angle, forever bound to its cosmic speed limit. But what about other particles? Minkowski called their paths world lines and these, unlike lights, graceful dance must always take steeper paths forever tethered to their mass. The right hand side diagram, which is a kind of a colored diagram, I have taken it from Wikipedia. However, this line, which is written as contraction der Elektromemen, which means contraction of electrons, I could not find it in the original diagram. I mean to say exactly written like this. Maybe it is the hand printed, <coughs> I'm sorry, hand tinted transparency presented by Hermann Minkowski. But on the left hand side, this is the original. Uh, paper and I have put up all the description, all the links, sorry, in the descriptions. So well, I mean to say, we, we can go ahead and we can, you can check it, the uh, German part of it. Now this is typically the hyperbolic, um, you know, um, geometry. So an event on an invariant hyperbola is transformed by the Lorentz transformation onto another point, right? And events that are simultaneous in one frame are on each on, on a separate hyperbola. And here it tells that after transformation, simultaneity is lost, but each event stays on, on its own invariant hyperbola. What I mean by this is this, it preserves the causal structure of space-time. And this I have explained in my earlier video also, that each of this line which are going to the future is basically all those timelines which are contained in the light cone and those are individual and invariant hyperbola. Now, Despite the radical shift which happened in our understanding of space-time brought forth by Minkowski, there exists a notable omission. A silence regarding the remarkable contributions of a prominent figure in physics. Was this omission deliberate or does it hold a deeper significance? In the next part of our video, as we delve into this intriguing question. Minkowski's omission of very, very important personality, perhaps the most important personality in the history of physics and mathematics, what and why did he did not mention his name? Coming up into the next part of our video. This person is none other than the great French mathematician Henri Poincaré. We know that Poincaré was a French mathematician, theoretical physicist and is often described as a polymath and in mathematics as the last universalist because he excelled in every field of his own line. Now, uh, Poincaré actually worked a lot on Lorentz transformation for vectors and the development of what is called the Lorentz group. I will come to the original paper of Poincaré and I will uh, show you what are his contributions. But what happened blatantly is that Minkowski did not mention anything about the contributions of Henri Poincaré. 
I'm going to show you the contributions earlier made by Ari Poenkhage and the lines that are taken up by Thilbaut's, uh, Professor Thilbaut's original research paper, which I'm citing over here. Poenkhage formalized the Lorentz transformations, which was not mentioned by Minkowski. He also introduced the concept of four vectors, not mentioned. He named and explored the Lorentz group, not mentioned. And Poenkhage also articulated what is called the principle of relativity, stating that laws of physics are the same for all observers in uniform motion. Now, this is uh, something uh, I would say which is worth noting of his research paper of Professor Philbot and others, that this is something which has absolutely not yet been mentioned, any reference of Ari Poenkhage in Minkowski's paper. Now, it was not that uh, initially that he did not point out, because Minkowski quoted uh, in a positive and a detailed manner the works of Poenkhage on two occasions, that is 1907 and 1908. First, on November 5, 1907, Minkowski gave a, basically a lecture at Göttingen mathematician Gesellschaft and he first exposed his ideas on special relativity and four-dimensional geometry. It is striking that Poenkhage's name is among the most cited ones. More precisely, I would say that the three most cited names are Max Planck, cited 11 times, Henry Anton Lorenz cited 10 times, Poenkhage cited 6 times, and by contrast, Einstein's name appeared only twice. It is also interesting to know that in this text, Minkowski credits Poenkhage for having elaborated the postulates of relativity in a form of understandable by mathematician. He also credits Poenkhage for having uh, discovered the invariance of the equations and how Poenkhage generalize Newton's gravitational force to a relativistic form by using several possible invariants as the Lorentz group. Now, here you can see that what Minkowski writes, uh, I mean to say it's an English translation, that I will here expose this symmetry from the start, which none of the cited authors did, not even Poincare, by using form of the equations, which makes it absolutely transparent. And he clearly mentions that he's going to expose about that and not even Poenkhage has explained on this. Further, if you see this, you will see that uh, what uh, actually Minkowski does is that first he introduce uh, the coordinates, x equals to x1, x2, x3, x4. Then for the coordinates in space and time, he refers this in the German called the fourth dimension and manifold. And then he introduces this part, which is called electromagnetic state in, uh, in space at any time. And then he uh, writes explicitly the Lorentz electrodynamic equations, which is in this partial differential form. So these are actually the steps in which Minkowski actually mentions and does not mention about Poenkhage. Now here you see, I have again taken the page, uh, the excerpt from Professor Thilbaut's research paper. He does not use tensor calculus notation and explicitly writes the sums over repeated indices. And that's quite true because during that time, tensor calculus was not known to him. And indeed, Poenkhage was used to three-dimensional vector. Therefore, Poenkhage's notation, whatever that is, for the electric four current was as clear to him as the four index notation used by Minkowski. By contrast, it seems that the fact that the use of space-time indices, which are 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on, led to make making more transparent to the four-dimensional symmetry was instrumental in psychologically convincing Minkowski that he was breaking new ground. Now, once we have talked about Minkowski's omission and what actually the contribution of Ari Poenkhage, it is right time that we should look into Poenkhage's paper and what was actually the contribution because without understanding the con uh, contribution of the predecessors or the ancestors, how can we, uh, you know, uh, uh, comment or talk on that? So in this part of the video, we are going to look into the contributions in framing special theory of relativity. Just quickly, I would like to show you now, this is the original paper. Again, you will find the description over here. And this is uh, the Poenkhage's elaboration. And I won't uh, take the courage to make the French pronunciation. Moreover, uh, uh, the translation says on the dynamics of the electron. And the report was presented on June 5, 1905 to the French Academy of Sciences. And uh, this was later published in uh, this uh, Italian journal. And I've uh, just zoomed that journal. And you can see the name of Henri Poenkhage, and it was Luglio, I think, in uh, uh, Italian, it's in, in the month of July. 
this was the original paper which was published in 1905 and when we are talking about Minkowski around 1907 he did not mention any of these contributions which Poikage has made now in order to know a little bit what is actually in this because I don't know uh, much about Italian uh, I would like to go back to one famous uh, you know historian her name is Galina Weinstein historian at the University of Haifa at Israel now this is actually the paper again it is in English and I have attached the link in the description you see the section 1 and section 4 clearly contains material directly pertaining to the principle of relativity and section 9 discusses gravitation section 6 to 8 discusses the configuration of electron and the present of what is called the Poincaré pressure so this gives you an idea that what actually Poincaré did or what is his contribution as put up by uh, Professor Galina Weinstein and this was not put up into Minkowski's description and earlier to that we have seen that Minkowski actually got a kind of a what we call a criticism now these are some of I would say the uh, lines which have been uh, commented by Professor Thilbot that the final section is devoted as you saw here if you can go back you can see that the final section uh, which is talking about uh, gravity is section 9 and it clearly mentions that the many of the key results of Poincaré on relativity are contained in this final section but in rather uh, untransparent and unpedagogical way and uh, uh, somehow Minkowski did not mention that. So he comments further that uh, knowing that the concepts of space time and proper time are crucial it is all the more surprising that Minkowski started downplaying the contributions of Poincaré in his December 1907 paper. Now so th this is actually what what is what the research tells us. Now you see that uh, uh, when we see that the 1907 paper of Minkowski uh, of a Lorentz transformation and this is young Minkowski so in conclusion when addressing his own method of reconciling gravitation with the postulates of relativity uh, which was notably less comprehensive than Poincaré's approach Minkowski peculiarly acknowledges, acknowledges Poincaré's contribution I would say in a footnote in a very rather unconventional way and this is that he writes that in a way completely different from the one I employ here, Henri Poincaré has tried to adapt the law of Newtonian attraction to the postulate of relativity. I mean to say in a very, very unconventional and a very, um, a very casual manner. The question that arises is that what could be the reason of Minkowski's omission and this omission does it result into further understanding of the roots of space-time physics and philosophy let us find out what was the reason of omission of Minkowski's uh, paper of the name of Ari Poikage coming up into the next part of our video the flames of the Franco-Prussian war burned bright casting long shadows on the relations between Germany and France including their mathematicians Germany had invaded France claiming the regions of Alsace and Lorraine and the latter being the very birthplace of Henri Poincaré. Now in 1817 amidst the escalating tensions young Felix Klein found himself drawn to the vibrant mathematical scene in Paris. Now there his, his path intervened with Sophus, Sophus Lee another rising star in the field and together they explored the newly published what is called the treatise of the substitutions by none other than Camille Jordan a work that proved pivotal in Klein's future research and eventually culminate in his groundbreaking Erlangen program yet the idyllic collaboration was cut short by the eruption of war Klein fueled by an ardent patriotism felt compelled to answer the call of duty and rushed home to volunteer for the army leaving behind the fertile ground of French mathematics now I am not in a position to criticize anybody I am just trying to put up what Professor Thilbot had done and what history says that what could be the reason of Minkowski's omission uh, not hurting anybody's sentiments also Adolf Hurwitz a German mathematician who worked on algebra analysis geometry and number theory was a common mentor and friend to Hilbert and Minkowski writes I fear the young talents of the French are more intensive than ours 
as we must must so we must master all the results to go beyond now years etched away the sharp edges of memory yet max born a keen observer of scientific discourse vividly recalled the summer of 1905 in his famous book no time to be brief and he writes i remember that minkowski occasionally alluded to the fact that he was engaged with the lorentz transformations and that he was on the track of new interrelationships so as you can see these are from the pages of history comments by physicists historians which spells out the thing also professor thilbot in his research paper does this writes that minkowski probably did not at all comprehend the concept of a novelty of einstein's june, june 1905 paper in the Col in his colon lecture minkowski says that while einstein deposed time from its high seat neither einstein nor lorentz made any attack on the concept of space by which he meant that einstein and lorentz did not realize that the spatial size associated with a moving observer differed from the spatial size slice associated to the original considered observer and he also writes further that the at the purely technical level all of the key mathematical structures of minkowski space time were already explicitly or implicitly contained in poincare's rendi conti paper which we have just seen so but but what was the basic uh, contribution he writes that minkowski had the boldness of realizing and publicizing the revolutionary aspects of these structures obviously i mean to say this was the first contribution everybody knew that whatever was the error minkowski had the boldness to publicize first get criticized and get publicized and that was uh, actually changed our vision of space and time it won't be worth my, uh, um, it won't be worth uh omitting or mentioning what minkowski's famous opening lines told henceforth space by itself and time itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and three dimensional geometry becomes a chapter in four dimensional physics you can read this uh, writers which is there on the screen and this is coming up to be one of the greatest and i would say a very philosophical and a deep uh, math has got a mathematical significance at the edge of science where equations falter and measurement ceases philosophy takes the torch here time and space dissolve into questions deeper than data can answer so let us step beyond the known and delve into the realm where thought transcends the physical and time and space become mysteries to the pondered not just measured so this is the famous uh, quotation of shakespeare and i would like to conclude by some of the famous quotations on time and space first made by none other than i uh, einstein in his famous book from a happening in three dimensional space as physics become as it were an existence in the four dimensional world so here you see the very basics essence of physics and philosophy comes and is a very popular book i think everybody has got relativity the special and the general a popular exposition hermann weil the german mathematician in his book philosophy of mathematics makes a very good and a famous quotation the world does not happen it simply is and then einstein further tells in his uh, in his thoughtful manner that you do not take seriously the four dimensionality of relativity but you consider the present as the only reality so you see he is urging his friend to take this seriously upon the death of his uh, schoolmate and a very close friend michel besso he writes now he has departed from this strange world a little ahead for me that signifies nothing for us physicists in the soul the distinction between past present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion probably this is the last photograph of albert einstein taken and he writes that since there exist in this four dimensional structure no longer any section which present now objectively the concepts of happening and becoming are indeed not completely suspended but yet complicated it appears therefore more natural to think of physical reality as a four dimensional existence instead of as hitherto the evolution of a three dimensional existence 
Well, that's all for today's video. I would like to thank you immensely because I know it is a very detailed and a long video. Please do subscribe to my channel Physics for Student. Click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. And this is my email ID and this is my other channel exclusive to general relativity where I'm posting nowadays videos. You can also follow me on my Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter account. Thank you for watching this video. Please put up your reaction in the comment box and coming up very soon a very good and a very surprising video for all of you till then stay tuned keep watching physics for students and i will be coming back very soon with a, uh, a video which is going to surprise all of you till then goodbye